Um, my name is Rocky Shatukatu. Um, I'm a mechanical senior project engineer working for Network Rail. Uh, before I go into talking about what I do at Network Rail, I just want to run you through my journey through engineering. Um, it, well, it all started as, a, as I used to be very interested in uh, all things moving and a uh, lot of machineries and cars and like watches and any, any kind of clockwork stuff as a kid. Um, school projects were always uh, um, basically presenting um, miniaturized cars and excavators and things like that, if I can remember. Um, that kind of piqued my interest in, in engineering and uh, obviously I was very, I was very interested in uh, elements of physics and um, mechanics and that piqued my interest to join uh, mechanical engineering. Um, I graduated in mechanical engineering in 2009, um, I studied in India. And um, over the period of the last uh, 10 years, I've worked in uh, uh, many different fields of engineering. Um, I wanted to talk about two main ones, the ones that I'm doing now, which is as a railway engineer, basically I'm an electrification engineer. I'll talk to you in a bit about what that means. And I wanted to tell you what I used to do prior to this, which was I was an energy engineer. I was into power generation and energy production. Um, I didn't want to prepare a lot of presentations and bore you, so I just thought I'll share some videos from, uh, from YouTube, which are fairly simple, and I can explain um, after you see the video what my role in that was. So uh, here we go. I haven't done this before. Hopefully, it should be okay. Oh, try that again. I saw the I saw the YouTube yeah. uh, screen then, Rakesh. So yeah, well, I think I you're on the right lines then. <laughs> I didn't um, tick those boxes. I wasn't used to that. So can you see that? I can. Yes. Right. So here we go. Here's a question for you: How many people does it take to turn on a light bulb? The answer seems simple. Just walk into a dark room, flip a switch, and instantly you can see, right? Well, the truth is there's a lot more to generating and delivering electrical power than you've probably imagined. Hi, I'm Lee Patrick Sullivan with Energy Now, and this Energy 101 video explains the system used to generate electricity. And it also explains what it really takes to turn on a light bulb. In order to understand energy, we first need to start at the source, literally. Mother Nature provides the natural resource we use to generate power. From natural gas to coal, ocean tides to mountain winds, the energy we need to create electricity must first be mined, harnessed, or collected from the earth. Some of these resources are finite, including fossil fuels like coal and oil, but others are unlimited like solar or wind power. But a lump of coal or a strong breeze alone won't create the power that turns on your light. For every energy source, a chemical or mechanical process is required to turn it into usable electricity. Every day, researchers work to find innovative ways to use our limited resources, process raw materials, harness renewables more efficiently, and find entirely new energy sources. Today, the majority of America's electricity comes from thermal power plants. Fuels like coal, natural gas, biomass, and uranium are used to heat water until it produces steam which powers a turbine and generates electricity. That steam turns propeller-like blades around a rotor inside the turbine. This turning rotor connects to a main shaft, which spins magnets with a coil inside a generator. It's the generator inside a turbine that converts mechanical energy into electric energy and creates electricity. Steam is an efficient method of producing electricity because the water can be recycled and reused as it changes back and forth between liquid and gaseous states. Trans so, um, well, as explained in the video, it kind of shows you a basic, very basic um, process of producing electricity. So I was an energy engineer, but I was involved in the design and manufacture of uh, generators. 
So generators, as you saw, are the ones that produce electricity from any form of, um, it could be hydroelectricity or steam powered or coal fired or in the nuclear, in, the, in a nuclear power plant, we use uh, a nuclear energy to, to heat the water and produce steam. So I used to be a mechanical engineer and I used to design and build generators. So that was my first job. Um, it was quite a challenging piece of uh, piece of work is uh, we used to produce very large generators up to 500 megawatt. To give you um, an idea of what that means, uh, 500 megawatt could kind of power a small city. Um, that's just one generator. So imagine um, you must have seen small diesel generators back at home. So imagine the size of that powering just your house and a 500 megawatt generator, which powers the whole city. So that was my first job. Um, I did that. Um, I did that for about five years. I, I was there for five years in India, and then after that, I moved to the UK in 2015 and 2012, uh, working for another company which did the same. Now, the best part about that job was I got to travel the world. Um, I got to travel and work in about 15 different countries. Um, I got to travel around the around the around the UK. Uh, that was like an amazing part of the job um, and obviously the problems that uh, we, we had to face was uh, very unique and uh, that it was very interesting um, and then again in, in then after that in 2015 I joined Network Rail and uh, I became what is called as an electrification engineer. Now if you go out into your platforms and uh, if, if you ever travel by train if you go out to the platform and if you look up you see a lot of wires up in the sky. Um, they are basically what is called as an overhead line equipment. And their job is basically to power the trains that go underneath that. Um, I have another video, which I wanna show you, uh, which will kind of talk you through what different parts of uh, the electrification system is. And then you can ask me any questions you have. So uh, here we go again. Transporting electricity from the power plant to your home is an Digger, wires, pylons, cranes, what becks! There's loads of machinery and equipment over there. Yeah, it's all needed to electrify this part of the railway. You see that? It's on one of the new electrification factory trains. Um, isn't electrifying a bad thing? My my mum tells me I'll electrify myself if I stick a fork in the toaster. Okay, yeah, being electrified is definitely a bad thing. But here we're just talking about converting the power source that trains can use to electricity. And that's a great thing. Bex is right. Railway electrification is a great thing. It enables faster, greener and more reliable trains. And as well as being better for passengers, electric trains are lighter and cause less wear and tear to the track. Still seems like a lot of disruption, just to change the power source. Well, they can't just plug them in. All sorts of things have to change. When the Victorians built the railways, they built them for steam trains, and many things they built weren't designed with electric trains using overhead lines in mind. Things like tunnels and bridges might not have enough room to fit both the trains and the new overhead wires that need to be installed. To create room, engineers might need to excavate and lower the track bed. Bridges might need to be jacked up, or even even rebuilt if they're too low. Changes might also need to be made around Hello? Alex, can Hi, you Rikesh. hear me? Uh, uh, so yes, I can. Yeah, I think the video, I think it's the video that's uh, just loading, yeah. isn't it? ...to make sure there's enough of a gap between... I'm not sure if it's my, inter my internet at all. I can't be... ...and the overhead wires to keep everyone at a safe distance and prevent people accidentally electrocuting themselves. It can cost a 
lot of money to make these changes, but safety is the top priority. Platforms themselves might need to be lengthened to accommodate the longer, high-capacity electric trains. Once engineers have created enough space to accommodate the overhead wires, they then can start to build the infrastructure that will supply the trains with the electricity. This includes electricity substations that provide the 25,000 volts of power to the wires, and masts and pylons that hold the wires high above the trains. Overhead line masts need strong foundations to ensure they don't sway when trains pass. These foundations are created by either piling, that's when hollow steel tubes are first vibrated into the ground and then struck repeatedly with a large hydraulic hammer until they are deep enough, or by pouring concrete into excavated holes to create a solid base onto which the masts are attached. Masts are placed approximately every 50 meters to keep the electrified wires running between them under the correct tension for trains to pass safely. Attached to the masts are cantilevers, structures that hold the electrified wires above the tracks. These may reach across one, two or more lines. To help electrify new lines, Network Rail has a state-of-the-art high output factory train that helps engineers electrify more tracks more quickly. This train has 23 vehicles, five dig the foundations and fill them with concrete, while another five drive the steel tube piles into the ground. Three vehicles install the main steelwork for the OLE structures, whilst a further five install small part steelwork to the masts and three hang up the wires. The train carries everything it needs to install the overhead wiring and the structures that hold the electrical equipment. So as well as piling tubes and steel gantry sections, it carries drums of electrical wire. Well, if it makes the journey go more quickly, I'm all for it. I agree. It's electrifying. See what I did there? Way too obvious, mate. Britain's Digital Rail. Right, so that kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse into what electrification is and uh, why we're doing that. So my job in Network Rail is basically to, um, to ensure that the electrification projects that we undertake happen uh, in a very efficient way, in a well-managed way, so that we take the value, make the most value out of it, and uh, we do the job to budget and to time because um, the money is basically coming from the taxpayers, which is you guys. Um, so I work as a project engineer, which means that my daily job involves like uh, looking at the designs for all these uh, overhead line uh, equipment that you just saw, um, making sure they are installed correctly, making sure, ensuring that they, they are going to be fit for purpose by, um, from every point of view, that they don't break or they don't fall apart. Um, they, um, they, meant they would, uh, I make sure that they will remain there for the extended period of time, usually which is about 40 to 50 years. Uh, the oldest electrification in, in, the, in the railway uh, in Britain happened in the 50s and the 60s, so you, you can still see them um, standing uh, even now. So that's kind of what I do at Network Rail. Um, apart from that, I also uh, involve very much into research and development activities in Network Rail, where we look at uh, um, next level, like we look at different types of computing methods to um, solve problems that we have on the on the network. Um, this is mainly to make sure that uh, uh, there are no disruption to passengers. And obviously, for example, if you guys are going from one point to another, you don't want to be standing on the platform and looking at the board and saying, "Oh, my train's delayed." So we, so a part of my job is to make sure we work towards technologies that enable us to. Um, reduce disruptions on the railway. Um, on that note, I think I'd like to conclude my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, so yeah, over to you, Alex, please. Brilliant, thank you, uh, Rakesh, for your brilliant presentation there. That, that was fantastic, right. and I really enjoyed the videos. Um, just someone in the chat, I think it was Joe in the chat, said uh, some of them were a little bit pixelated at times. So do you have the titles for those on YouTube that maybe they could go and watch after as well? I can simply share the links onto the chat, if that helps. Oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fab. Uh, um, so, yeah, if, if, if you type for those that. into there, and then, yeah, they can have a look at those after as well if they didn't get to watch. Parts of it? No, don't worry at all. No, it's sometimes it's the it's the internet um, between both of us as well. <laughs> that, that could be a I've trouble. I've never but, tried using. Um, uh, personally, I was. Able to... I've, I've never tried using. Yeah, they uh, could be Zoom a little bit tricky. Sometimes. It's a bit tricky. Yeah. 
that's all right. But yeah. I'm... So we'll go into some of the questions now, Rakesh, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so the first one we've got here is, um, is, is what you do, is it fun? Do you enjoy your job? Yes, I love it. Um, I think uh, the best part of it is like um, seeing different problems every day and uh, having having to actually sit down, think about it. It's a bit like a puzzle every time you get a problem um, and applying applying your uh, your theoretical knowledge that you gain in university. Um, I never used to like math very much. I used to be good at math, but I never used to like it that much. So it's 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 uh, you always wonder when you're studying matrices and I don't know. Uh, differential capitalism and integration. What do you do with these things really? But when you come to the real world, this is where you apply those things. Uh, you build them into softwares, which helps you solve very complex problems. So I, I, I really enjoy what I do because um, these, this is where I apply those things. And, and the best part about the job is um, what I build, I can actually see when I, go, when I go in the train. So I know that I'm enabling the journey from one point to another because I managed to build, I help them build that uh, the mass and the overhead line and the electrification in a nice way so i think it gives you that immense pleasure as it's, it's one of those small things that you can you it's little things in life that gives you that joy so i i really love that uh, and i really love what i do so we've got a really good question here about um saying does it make you f uh, feel that the rails are safer when kind of you fix them and I kind of want to add to that as well. Is it quite a proud moment uh, when yeah. you see kind of people using them that, that obviously that you've worked on? Exactly. So this is this is what I was getting to. So as an engineer, your primary responsibility is to your profession to make sure um, you have done it to the best of your abilities and um, your competence, and um, making sure and then seeing that um, seeing that people are using it and it's working perfectly is sort of like a it's sort of a validation you get that uh, you've you've done a good job, and uh, so yes, I I I I would definitely use the rail with that I've built uh, because I feel confident at it. Yeah, but it's I bet it's a proud but a bit of a strange moment sometimes yeah. when you're using it as well. Yeah, yeah uh, we've, true. Uh, we've got another one here. They said the uh, you might have already talked about this, but they had a bit of a problem getting on uh, with mm -hmm. the Zoom link at the start. But they said, uh, what inspired you to become an engineer? So um, I think it's a it's a collective thing. I don't know. I've always, uh, from as far as I can remember, I've always nurtured this uh, this love for machines. Um, I've always enjoyed um, watching, reading, and uh, you know, looking at large machines. I used to be that guy in uh, in school, like that kid in school who used to tune into Discovery Channel way too many times and uh, watch these uh, the videos of like you know large machines mega structures and these kinds of things and it always inspired me like it's it's funny when only humans can do that like when you put put your will and your thoughts together it's it's just sky's the limit isn't it you can just go building and building you can well obviously there's a good and the bad to it say so one of the things that also inspired me with my first job was the fact that um, uh, the renewable energy and I was quite passionate about that. Um, we did a lot of work to uh, inspire kids in India to take up renewable energy as their, uh, their careers, because that's something we desperately need. And I, as you all know, you must be you must be watching the news. You know, fossil fuels, um, the old ways of generating electricity is is not sustainable. And going forward, we need to be interested in. Uh, we need to invest more uh, resources. Uh, younger minds and whatnot into into producing more newer noble methods of uh, producing energy which are sustainable for the future and that's kind of inspiring and that, I, I love that and that's what got me into doing all of that all of those things I do. So we've got a question here asking uh, I think you've touched on this already saying um, does it feel weird when you go on your own uh, rails I know you said it's a proud moment as well uh, but does it feel weird but then we've got another one saying is it a popular job what you do? Um, so the first question was it around whether I feel safe uh, going on the rails? Or? Yeah, so the, so the first one was about safe, and then they've, they're asking here, does it feel weird when you're on kind of your own rails? No. Oh, so first thing, we don't go on our own. So that's uh, a national rule because uh, every time we go onto the rails, uh, it is necessary to have a what is called as a safe system of work. Uh, this is why to all you people out there, do not go on the rails. It's not 
it's not safe because we we access rails by isolating rails as in we completely shut off the train movement between the track and then we go out there and even when even then when we go out there we, we have a safe what is called a safe system of work and that involves having multiple people uh, people looking out for each other and you know doing work only when they are competent at doing it so because network rail is so in fact, Network Rail is one of the safest railways in the world. We operate one of the safest railways in the world because safety is a prime, is a very, is the most important thing in our in, in my company. I've never worked for a company that is so much into safety of their workforce and of the people. Um, so I feel very safe going out um, with Network Rail while I'm following the procedures and rules that are set. Um, I think, I think they just. I think they just clarified, Rakesh, that it's um, when you're on the train yourself. Oh, on, the yeah. on, on the rails that you've worked on. Oh, yeah. Does it, does it feel strange that way? Sorry if I confused it, you then. No, it's all right. It, it, I actually feel proud about it. Um, it, <laughs> it. Well, actually, I'm one of those guys, like if I'm, if I'm with my girlfriend or with my friends, and if we're going in on a patch where, which I kind of helped build, I'd, I'd be like well, bragging about it. I'd be like, this is what I did. <laughs> so it is, it's kind of like a proud thing, uh, and I, I really enjoy that. And then the next question was, uh, is it a popular job that you have? Uh, uh, um, it's, well, popular as in, is it interesting? It is very interesting. Do a lot of people take up rail engineering? Not many, not many, as many as there should be, I think. Um, I think it's probably because it's not very well known. Uh, when you say engineering, uh, obviously trains is something that comes to your mind, definitely. You know, anything that moves like cars, trains, aircrafts, these are the things that kind of uh, are more popular because you see them in the TVs, you see them glorified in movies and whatnot. Like, so you see those things and therefore, um, th I, th I think overhead line engineering is a bit more uh, niche. It's very niche stream of, uh, stream of engineering. Um, and I think personally, I really enjoy it. I, do, I enjoy what I do, uh, but it's not as popular as it should be which means that there is a huge skill gap. And therefore, I think it's a great place to work and it's a great thing to do because you will all, your skills will always be in demand because it's such a niche field. And I know you talked about um, training and, and you kind of interested in it when you, when you were younger. Did, did you kind of play with trains when you were younger? Uh, was it something else that interested you when you were younger? Were you building things maybe when you were younger? Yeah, I used to, I used to be very much into building um, uh, planes, actually. Um, remote control RC planes and RC, like little RC cars and stuff like that. Play around with motors and like, you know, model cars and boats and doing things like that. So it's those things like it's it's a job it's a kind of a fulfillment and a kind of like a, a proud moment when you actually build something and it works. So that that's that kind of carried on as I grew up. Um, it just transpired into something bigger. Um, I think one of the jobs that I enjoyed the most was uh, while I was uh, working in India for uh, for a company um, when I moved to uh, UK and started working for a company called Brush, where we made large generators for. Um, different places across the country in the Middle East. Uh, so I got a lot of opportunities to go work in the Middle East, um, in in different parts of Europe. Um, in in like moving out of India itself was a big deal, and then coming here and working here, knowing those cultures. The, all these things are kind of part of the job. It's like what they say, you know, like if you if you love what you do, you don't really work a single day. You basically living your life. So it, it, that's kind of it's, that's how it's been. Kind of hinted on that. What what was it like when you kind of first moved here to work in the UK? Was it oh, was it nervous or was it exciting? What what was it? It was exciting. The whole decision around moving to the UK, I made it in like a month or something. So it was very instant, very uh, uh, like that. And then here you go. I've been here seven years now. Um, so it was it was very exciting. It was very uh, it was a culture shock when I got here because you know it's it's a different thing. It's perceptions are different when when you're outside and look into it. So, I mean, within the nobody at all like within the UK, like you know, the, the difference in culture again is quite massive, isn't it? Like, so if you go to different countries inside the UK, it's still like very different. Like Wales, England, uh, Scotland, um, they're all different and different. So that that was kind of very surprising, and I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Like within traveling, and also UK is so very place such that we can travel around the world quite easily from here. And that's been, that's all been like, you know, keeping me here and uh, really enjoyed it. But not, not, not the same weather though, I bet, <laughs> Rikesh. 
You can't have everything, can you? No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Uh, we've got a really interesting question here. So yeah. they're asking, how does the train actually stay on the track without it falling off? That's a brilliant question. Um, I ha it's a bit technical. So two things. One way, the wheels of the train, as in the actual wheels, are not flat like you see in the car. They're kind of conical. And it's called as conicity. You might want to go, I'll type it down there. You might want to check Google it yourself and find out how that works. Um, it's called conicity of the uh, train, uh, the wheels of the train. And it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting way of doing it. So you can actually just take just the wheels, keep it on the track and push it and it'll continue going for long distances without coming off the rails. It's a very interesting, uh, there are videos on YouTube by Network Rail explaining exactly how that does. How, it, how that works it's that's a quite an interesting thing you might want to check it out yeah i think that'd be very good uh, for those participants to have a watch yeah. and have a, have a look at that as well um what's kind of the most interesting or fun project that you've kind of worked on do you think with network rail with network rail um i think the current project that i'm in um it's uh, called western we're building a new railway um from uh reading well in between reading and langley from langley all the way into heathrow terminal five so that is basically a, a new railway, a completely new project. It's a one point over a billion pound investment. And I'm the uh, senior project engineer for all the overhead electrification. So this is a very interesting project that I'm working on. Um, it's a multi-million multi -million project, um, pound project. And it's, it's really interesting to see uh, something from scratch that you're building all the way into Heathrow Terminal 5. I'm just thinking about the imagine, imagining the number of people that'll be using those services um, is just it's just mind-boggling and it's really good. And I think the last question we have here, um, Rakesh, is just asking about along the way in your career, have you got any tips or advice or anything that you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the participants listening today? Absolutely. Um, so I actually wrote it down. I think I did think about this and what I want to tell you. Um, I think the most one of the most important things that helped me, you know, through this throughout this whole thing is the fact that I was actually interested in doing what I am doing. So that's something I think it's a key learning. I mean, if I wasn't, if I was never interested or if I was pushed into doing this, I wouldn't have enjoyed this as much. And uh, I probably think I wouldn't have continued doing what I'm doing because that's one thing that's absolutely important. The other thing is uh, you need to find a mentor for yourself when you are in a, when you're doing a, a when you're into engineering and when you're studying. Um, there is no substitute to experience. Uh, education gets you so far, um, but experience gets you uh, that it fills those gaps which education doesn't provide. It's always good to have a mentor and uh, learning from a mentor or even a group of people. Like basically, surround yourself with like very good people, like you know exceptional people and that will help you grow even further. Um, and the final thing I want to say is be kind. Um, it, throughout your, it, it's, it's, it's not only important as just as an, as an engineer, but also as a person. Um, it always pays back. But, uh, and that's, that's something I, I think I'd like to, that's the three pieces of advice I would like to give you. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, that advice uh, with the right. participants there, Rakesh. And I just want to say a massive, massive uh, thank you to you for taking time of your day to do this for us um, right. and do the brilliant presentation and answering those questions. And, and thank you to those participants for sending in the questions as well. Um, I hope you've enjoyed answering them those today, I've, Rakesh. I've really enjoyed this. Um, I think uh, I haven't done this before, but I think this was really, really nice. And uh, I, I hope like, uh, I hope everyone that participated today also enjoyed the uh, presentation i didn't want to do a lot of powerpoint presentations and things like that. it's very corporate -y, so i thought if there are like a lot of young engineers over there or young budding engineers i mean what i would recommend is uh, if you're interested in what i've been saying you, you should go to uh, if you want to find out more about things that network rail does um please follow the uh, channel that network rail has um it's a youtube channel just go in there they talk to you about like basic things in rail and like how things work around you know overall and it's really interesting even when i go into it there are subjects that i don't know about and i find it really interesting to look at them and uh, uh, go through them so yeah that's uh yeah so thank you very much for that fantastic fantastic thank you rakesh um for those 
at the participants, I, I've put a survey. I think I sent it to you, Rakesh, which I didn't mean to. Sorry, I, I meant to send it That's to right. the participants uh, for them to complete a survey after the interview's finished today. Um, and also, I hope you've been inspired to take on our Leaders Award competition and start designing some of your own inventions, start becoming an engineer yourself, and use our resources at leadersaward.com. Uh, these interviews all go up onto our YouTube channel, at Primary Engineer. Um, so go check out uh, Rakesh's, which will be going up. Again, maybe you want to have another, another watch or some others that are on there. Lots of network rail ones that are on there as well um, and come, um, join us for our upcoming interviews next week um, I think we'll end it there so bye everyone bye Rakesh thanks thanks Alex uh, see you everyone cheers bye